What you do notice though is as you're looking around is you start examining the items in the ceiling a bit mm -hmm. more and you start noticing that there appear to be mechanical but not replicating organic limbs in the ceiling. In fact, it looks like they would be capable of reaching down and then back up. Right. And you notice once you start examining a bit more that they seem to have a wide array of equipment, both surgical and things that frankly you, you don't have the expertise to recognise. Yeah. yeah, like there's a whole load of limbs over there. Uh, there's, well, I say a whole load, there's just these, really. There's lots so, more on the ceiling. Oh, my gosh. I mean, we're not human limbs. Bertie stands on the table and I lift it. the lever to see if it goes any higher. It does! <laughs> Bertie shakes it again. <laughs> Hello! Yes, very friendly terms. Oh. About a MacGuffigan to like One of them moves. Uh, it then angles itself towards Bertie. What looks like some kind of mechanical lens or something rotates. And it just holds what seemingly is eye contact with Bertie for a moment. Uh, Bertie grabs it with his left hand. Mm -hmm. You're holding it. You're holding it? Yeah, it didn't try to evade you. Hello there, Mr. Seeling. I am Sir Bertrand McGuffin. And who who has the pleasure of making my acquaintance? He pokes it. Leave, leave the ceiling alone. Another one it. comes down. It appears to be of a similar but not identical construction and is now examining Bertie from a different angle. Do you yeah, think the ceiling did this itself? Like, Mr. Ceiling might be our most dangerous foe yet. A third arm starts coming down. This one has a needle on the end. Again, it is moving slowly it's, and it's not being stealthy, uh, but it does appear to be moving acid, directly at it. Acid splash, range cutting. Uh, please do so. It stops, retracts, another thing comes down. It appears to be something akin to a microscope, given that the two wider angles appear to be occupied. <laughs> And it comes down and begins examining Hamid. What you did, I don't normally approve of this sort of thing, but we're going to drown you in a bucket. If you'd like, I can show you now. I think you've had some adjustment time. All right, all Mr. Ceiling. Comes close. I like having a name. If you'd like to follow me, I can introduce you to me. Yeah, go on then. It begins leading you off and begins leading you to the stairwell that you were at before. Mm -hmm. Are you okay with stairs, Zolf? You go up about ten floors. Gosh. Get to the top of the stairwell and begins leading you through. It then stops. There are a set of double doors ahead of you. The voice isn't coming from the orb, it's just coming from sort of everywhere again. Now this can get a bit scary for people. The doors open. Oh, what did we go that lock? Did you see the mechanism there? So the first set of lights fun. in the room on the other side have a great time. flash on. Then the, the next set, then the next the set, and the next, and the next. It becomes rapidly apparent that the room on the other side is massive. It is huge. And at first glance, appears to be full of large columns. They are roughly five foot wide each, and they appear to be filled with liquid. As you approach the column, you see it is filled with a liquid, sort of bluey green, and within it are a large amount of mechanisms, of equipment, tubing, piping. However, as your eyes adjust to the gloom and you press up against it, you see that it's all converging, as if on an hourglass, towards a brain. You see that the mechanisms and all of the equipment leads away from the brain. There is another one above it, with more leading into it, and another one. And this and another cavernous one. room is full and of columns. And it disappears columns. up in towards the ceiling, which is easily 50 foot up. There are hundreds. Whose brains are these? This is me. between him and the door. Okay, before Hamid gets a chance to move... Oh, the, good. <laughs> That's what was reassuring. The control panel begins to vibrate beneath your hands. You've still been pushing away and... Hammering. I'm pretty much standing on it. Like, it's big and I'm not very tall. Suddenly, it erupts in front of you and just a random assortment of components are thrust outwards and form an arm. Oh, ah, big, spooky machine. Pulling out from the rest of the machinery, tearing itself out. Components rearrange themselves into something approaching the arm. All of the components of it start forming themselves. 
broken components are making parts of it as much as fixed ones are. It is clearly a hodgepodge amalgamation. This isn't some kind of pre-made security mechanism. This is retrofitting on the fly with an enormous amount of power. It shunks itself up till it stands and it gives a mechanical roar which is vaguely reminiscent of whatever you heard when you were crossing the channel. Like it activates some unwanted memories for you. But it gives a roar and tears itself out from the control panel which is left a couple of bits. Mechanically it is a large monster. Its arms come out from overdeveloped shoulders dropping down to almost like its knees, maybe its feet. It's clearly like something trying to go, humanoid enough, go! And it has no face. It has arms, legs, and a huge bulbous mass in the middle, and e core and other liquids sort of dripping from it. I stumble and stagger to the door and open it. Sasha's mechanical man is stood on the other side of the door. I squint up at him. What? An extremely distorted voice comes out of the mechanical man. Go back. Get out. What? Bit of a delay. Go back. Get out. Back where? Out of what? It reaches out and grabs your hand surprisingly delicately for something so large. And then it drops down on one knee. Sometimes you have to try. You don't get to give up. Sasha needs you. Is there still a chance? There's an easy way to find out. Hammond bolts for the... It doesn't even use an elevator. So you head out and you start presumably still on foot, just bolting it. Yep. It is a runnable distance, like I said, you're only like across the way. Yep. You notice there's a uh, billboard on the side. It just says, look after her for me. You eventually drag yourself into bed, have a very, very poor time going to sleep, and eventually do so. You find yourself on the ocean and you are on the boat that you crossed the channel in. It is a little bit choppy, it is not stormy, and there is nothing happening, but it's a very... This is a type of dream you are familiar with. Mm -hmm. This is a type of dream where you feel like you're awake, but are very aware that you must be dreaming. So it's a lucid. Right? It is yeah. completely lucid. <sighs> right, what do you want then? There's no response. Eventually, to your practiced eye, you see what appears to be an enormous storm forming on the horizon. It is potent, it is a, it's a shipwrecker. You've seen that type before. Mm -hmm. Time begins to accelerate, almost time lapse in its scale, sure, yeah, yeah. in that you are watching a, a cyclone basically build, but at the very edge of your vision. It is growing and it is growing and it is growing. It's drawing nearer very slowly, and then it suddenly comes right up to where you are. It's a very unnatural storm, in that it looks like someone's taken a storm and cut it in half. All of the front is piled up piled up towering into the sky above you but you are in calm waters 100 feet away from you is the choppiest cyclone you can imagine there's a few water spouts kicking around right okay what are you angry you usually are what do you want eventually you start seeing a figure walking towards you over the choppy waves they're walking on the water it's a humanoid figure and at this distance it looks normal size. The figure approaches and as the sort of curtain of rain and storm passes, you see him step out into the car. It is a figure that has little in the way of the face. It is, again, to your eye, it's like someone has taken the water from the very deepest parts of the ocean you've ever seen and plonked it in front of you in a humanoid shape. And it's just stood there and it is staring at you completely impassively. Okay, what? Consider me frightened. You're a god. It's, yes, very powerful. What? Why am I here? What are you doing? It reaches its hand out and then suddenly, all at once, shoots up from the water a trident and it shoots into its hand. It 
holds it and then throws it onto the boat and it clatters at your feet. Don't! What am I supposed to... Brilliant! I've got that back! I... What do you want? What am I going to do? Nothing I've done has helped. I'm not good at this. I don't know what I'm doing. stands above you impassively and looks at you and looks at the trident and looks back. I am not going to be intimidated by your strong arm of blackmail. So, you sink beneath the waves. The last thing you see is their face staring impassively at you as you sink, and you sink into the darkness. You wake up, it's the next morning. Then you have one person who's just like, Oi! 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 Is he just wandering around flashing? Oi! Why is he? He's going to sort of pawnbrokers yeah, and jewellers and goldsmiths and, and that sort of thing. Walking around going, Jules! Jules! I have jewels! Does anybody eat jewels? Jules! This uh, person is, they have a stall, it's, it's, it's fairly like humble, but it's there. She's going, Oi! 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 Um, Oi! Nobody notices on that roll, presumably. Yes, he does. Oi! Oh, hello. Oi. This is a, this is a lovely, humble little stall you have here. Hmm? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're looking to shift them, yeah? I'm looking to sell these jewels for money. Hmm? So More freely convertible currency. You are addressing a gnome. A gnome that is, is short by gnomish standards. They have huge white hair. Massive white hair. They wear fingerless gloves and they are wearing many, many layers. And they have a stall which just has the word... Fantasy. And it has knows, a it? series of uh, a series of like trinkets and other items dotted around on this on this fairly fairly small stall. Okay, sun sets, the moon rises. Oh, how much moon? Moon, and then is slightly overcast. Yay! Mm. No moon. So By moon, it's not. No moon. It's not worst case scenario, but similarly, you could have done with some proper cloud. Is it? It's okay. Could have been worse. Medium moon. <laughs> Turns out that scoping the place out ahead of time and picking the guard who will offer the lowest DC for perception is a good call. Um, does she I... actually do an extra flip while going? <laughs> like ridiculous. <laughs> Barely. Show. No one can see it. It's so dark. She, but... she, she, she leaps hand first onto the top of the fence, ah! twirls a few times in handstand mode, dismounts. Raises her hands like her actor, and no <laughs> one sees because she did really well on stealth. As you raises the thing that says <laughs> ten on it. <laughs> um, Grizz up. You make it inside. However, again, it's just a bit of a noisy landing. The guard comes running back. You are. What are your intentions once you're inside? You know that you've botched the stealth. Does the fence? Is it chain link all the way to the? I'm assuming actually. Is it chain link? No, it's um, bars. Okay. Does it have like a solid base? Yes. I will uh, push myself up, because I'm tiny, not yeah, yeah. small, uh, push myself up against that solid base. We should have planned for Hamid to put invisibility. There's definitely some wrong. dogs barking, and he comes running back. Another guard comes from round the side where the entrance is, and then the two guards are there with a pair of dogs, and they are looking at one another. And I'm not going to RP it, but you do hear that the ball runs like, OK, I, I, something's definitely up. What? I don't know, I haven't seen something, so it's definitely up. And they're like, okay, cool, complete your control, we're going to double patrols, and we will send someone warehouse to warehouse and just check everything's all right. They're like, okay, all of this is panning out, 
about two feet from you yeah. because you are completely flat, plastered right up against the border and there's just a little guttering overhang. As you and I hear the bell and start sprinting for the yep, fence. you hear it yes. loudly and then By yeah, the time you they turn up, set the off is together. Over. Yep, you can take 10 on that because you've taken the time to get the timings right. Hamid's terrible at climbing, but Azu can lift him quite a lot, far a lot of the way up. Basically what I do is I lift Hamid up and just punt him a little bit. <laughs> and then like Sasha grabs him. Meanwhile, Grizzle. Sorry, I'm just silhouetted <laughs> in the mood like... <laughs> <laughs> So you both share that moment of that perfect shining eye contact moment of how did this happen? What are we doing here? Are you getting me to Rome? Grisop, right? Who are you? Yes, I'm probably thinking so. I'm now going to give you a proper description rather than a quick episode ender. They are a quite tall for an elf. Elf. Full elf. Ooh. Not a half elf. A full elf. What's their accent? Their accent, they are speaking to you in flawless, received pronunciation. They they are dressed up to the nines. Very elegantly, but there's far too much jewellery for someone who's just going around the place. Like, they're very, very kind of well put together in in a a way that you've, yeah. Immediately ungratiated themselves. Yeah, I know, right? They look so out of place in here. Like, they're clearly from... Somewhere that they had to pull all kinds of strings to get her down here. I could get you to Rome. If you'd be willing to answer me a couple of questions. Depends on the questions. Get on with it. Is Sasha there? Who wants to know? Eldarian! Winter! Let's go! Hold hands. Everyone, such a big circle! Such a big circle! Everyone, keep your eyes closed and do not let go! Eldarion goes quiet and then begins to scream. And you can all feel like an electric current running through your hands. Eldarion then steps back and joins the hands of the two people that she was holding. And then, as that's happening, the enormous pit. Do you know that sort of gravity well thing I was thinking? I'd like you to take a ima- moment and imagine if a pit the size of her hand came out for press the digitation. This pit is just enormous. It sweeps out from Eldarion. The stone circle plummets down into it. There is a split second of Eldarion there, eyes closed, before Eldarion also plummets downwards. Eldarion is crying and smiling as she drops away and is staring 100% at Sasha as she does so. same time there is the distinct sound of something impossibly huge suddenly covering the remaining distance it is just raw noise I, I, there is no sort of oh I wonder what that is it's like someone took the sea and then hit someone with it it's just <laughs> I open my eyes I have to look please give me the fort save um, Hamid is going to scream eyes closed, not at Grizzop specifically, <laughs> but mostly to Ishak because he knows I'm that it. he knows that he wanted to open his eyes really badly. He knows Ishak is quite like him. Oh, Seventeen. Could you please give me a reflex save, Grizzop? Can you give me a My reflex save? Are so bad, ben. Why You're a paladin. It's fine. No. Oh, that's yeah. Okay, that's pretty good. That's twenty. Twenty-six again. So the massive swirling smoke sweeps back from your position coagulates is the best way to describe it to a hand just a hand that's all and this hand dwarfs the sky the thumb stretches out further than you can see to one side the little finger stretches out further to the other you cannot see beyond the wrist because it's beyond the curvature of the plane that you're on the religion absolutely 20 yeah, you 
just saw a god. Yeah! More importantly, you just got away from a god. As you're starting... I'm so stressed. I'm so you know what you're doing to me? <laughs> As you're starting to slip, like, because of the, like, whoa, and then, obviously, the whole eye stretch, blah, 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 begins happening. Vasek just grabs you, yanks you closer, and goes, no, you don't! <laughs> Everyone, please give me a fort save. You have to give another one, Grizzop, because you were getting cheeky. 20. Mm-hmm. 23. Mm-hmm. 18. Mm-hmm. 14. You are holding hands with Beaming, guess it, and... I'm going to say Ed. Yeah, sure. Give me a reflex save. And Beaming and Ed. Okay, uh, that's that great. is 20. 20? Okay. Hamid? You're obviously holding hands with Ishag, there's no version where you're not. I'll let you pick the other person. There we go. 13 on my reflex save. Oh, Hamid doesn't do himself. So is that a killer character crack? Oh no, Alex just cracked his neck, guys. Just so I can make sure I've got it right, you were holding hands with Beaming and I said Ed, right? And you rolled... 20. Cool. Oh god. I'm going to describe something first. Hamid. The first thing that happens is you take 3d6 damage, just straight out the gate. You know how I said that being stretched out doesn't hurt? Turns out it does sometimes! Who are you? <laughs> it's not good. The other thing that happens is that your hands then slip from the people, like it's way too much, like you're literally curling fetal. And Ishak of all people screams, No! 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 And you feel Ishak grab you. I'll get to Sasha in a bit. Grizzle, did you close your eyes for the return journey? Give me a full save, I'm making the call. Okay, yeah, fine. No! No! Perfect. Cool. Deal with Grizzle later as well. No! You hear from the distance, Hamid's eyes snap open. Quick description. Everyone's here apart from Eldarion, Sasha, and Grizzop. So Sasha comes to. She's like, ah, oh, again? As she comes to, yeah, there's a, there's a moment of like... Uh, not again and this familiar wooziness and the like wanting to spring into action because usually it happens in the middle of a fight and it's the second and a half before she remembers her friend is dead impaled through the skull in front of her you, you manage to pull like one of the bodies that is sort of gently covering him a little bit yep. and he's there yeah face down tattered gaping gaping wounds and his eyes are still open albeit facing down she turns him over and closes his eyes and gives him a hug. She is like smeared in her own blood. Her oh, there's, own vomit. there's red everywhere. Yeah. Her but own... also. Yeah. A bit of green. Uh, yeah. She's smeared in red and green and she is about as articulate as I am. As the fires are Genuinely. licking up around the pit, really? there are screams and cries from up high, there are roars, there are explosions, yeah. and yeah, there is there is a moment of stillness for you. And by Cicero being distraught, I mean you can't bring him to. Yeah, okay. So, like, slash you through his bonds, and then, like, tries to shake him, and, like, do you know how to teleport? Is there any way out of this city? Uh, I mean, we could take the tunnels, try the aqueducts, maybe. Which way are the tunnels? Just point. He, he's, he's quite pliable, he just points more or less back the way you came. Literally puts him on her back, mm-hmm. like a backpack, mm-hmm. and starts walking. It's the goblin. It's the goblin's fault, because if, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean it's, a, it's a coup, but better the evil you know. I mean, we uh, get Galbraith, because at least make him do what you want. You can't just... You can't just... So she can't puts just really... him down and says, like, if you say that one more time, I will kill you here.
there are there are some rolling hills leading towards the mountain there are some woods there's a seems to be a smallish river nearby and we start from a distance and there is some kind of estate it is a kind of combination farm villa thing going on mm-hmm. it, it clearly is out in the middle of nowhere and self-sufficient there, there is nothing really nearby within sight you're getting a bit closer there's a lot of children children large what? large numbers of sort of children roaming around some of them seem to be sort of playing and sort of laughing in the farmyard and so on some of them appear to be doing like maneuvers yes. like drills things like that mm. and um They're having fun standing on each other's heads <laughs> we we head towards the, the main building it is it's actually a very sort of calm serene place Although there's a larger amount of sort of weapons and armour than you would necessarily expect. <laughs> so we, we head upstairs and there is a, a very, very small child actually is seemingly being led into an office by two quite heavily armed men. They they lead this child into the office and on the far side of the desk we see... Uh, well, she's not as scrawny as she once was. <laughs> but like, she's kept in shape. She runs around after people a lot. Uh, Oh, sad. Genuinely. So this uh, child, the, the two guards seem to lead the child in. Mm-hmm. The child pushes through them quite forcefully, stands in front of them, hands on hip. Uh, sorry, sorry, lady. Uh, basically, these, these two said they want some help. I don't know if they're worth your time, but, you know, thought, thought I'd uh, all right. show them up. Everything all right? Yeah, it's all right. Uh, you, you head off, little Maximus. Are you coming down for uh, manoeuvres later? Yeah, I, I need to see how well your rehearsals have been going. We've got a show next week. Right. Yes, we do. The kid sort of pushes through the guards who look a little bit nonplussed and then heads out of the office. How can I help you, gentlemen? Throws uh, a dagger up in the air, catches it. It spins on her finger. <laughs> she catches it on her finger. The, the two guards look at one another, lean forward and go, um, we, we hear that you're the um, mm-hmm. th- the best at uh, yep. you know keeping stuff secure and well we we we, we, we want to hire you and, and and all of it really. All right, I've got my. Uh, she pulls down a kind of bit of paper. This is my. Uh, I think people are going to call them moral codes in the future. It's a new thing I've come up with. Let me know if what you need keeping secure, like crosses any of these, and uh, I'll get my team on it. Thanks. I think we'll leave it there for 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 Sasha. There is still pipe organ left. It's not the entirety of it. It's just most so it's of a it. Bad transformer. And additionally, the uh, it does not have a glass orb literally like on a bobble head atop. It's a little bit more chunky than that. Oh, it's in the, it's, it's in it, the middle. It, it's Krang from yeah. TMNT. Uh, it's not in its middle, unfortunately, oh. but it is sort of closer towards the like where the bottom so of a person's neck apple would be. Of, yeah, of, it's of an of Adam's brain. apple of brain. Right. Hit the weak spot for massive damage. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and addition- like... Additionally, it's asymmetrical. It has one arm longer than the other, and it appears to have significant amounts of machinery built into it. It is quite a bulbous torso, and it has quite long and thin limbs. The the sort of skull, for lack of a better word, is, like I said, embedded. In the right arm, you, Cell, reckon it has some kind of firing mechanism. Oh um, oh no. Probably something range, you don't know. The left oh no. hand has something extremely sharp-looking built into it. <laughs> um, more, kind of, its more kind of claw-based than anything else. You also all notice that it has large amounts of fluid built into it, like coursing through it. Does it have, like, a an arm that rotates cartridges. Yeah, it does. It's rotating different uh, things. Like it's like potions and it just like fires them into your face. Yep. So I move towards Zolf, towards the electrified, towards the electrified door, but not to the electrified door, and away from the blobs, and I cast. So I am going to save you a bit of time, Bryn. The fireball goes off and has no effect on it whatsoever. No! Immune to magic. The enormous pipe organ thing moves 30 feet towards cell. Wow. It was nice knowing you guys. Oh. Bye, little buddies. Bye.
right there. Uh, it immediately reaches up, yep. swipes at you, and it pumps out fluid through the palm, as it does, yep. that misses you. Oh, good. Its other hand suddenly twists awkwardly and shuts, and a bomb <gasps> appears in its hand. It aims the hand and fires it as if a cannon at soft, <gasps> specifically. Mm -hmm. It explodes. So you immediately know that this is a splash weapon. It hits all square in the chest. The creature then five foot steps away from Azu. Azu looks at the thing and she says quietly, I'm going to take you down. That's a natural That one. is an wow. unfortunate roll. Wow. Basically, for what it's worth, it's not that you're missing, it's just that it's bing! Okay, that's just <laughs> a solid steel girder that I hit. I, that's not gonna work. It's, there's an element of trying to hit the bits that need to be hit with this thing. Yeah. Cure moderate wounds. So that is 48. Yes. Does casting that spell trigger an attack of opportunity from the creature? Oh, I guess so. It's a hit. Damage. Here's a coming. Oh my god, if you get taken out. Possibly. Oh, Ben. <gasps> Big bad, big bad, angles itself downwards, swarming in spiders, and tries to punch Azu into a small puddle. Azu looks up at it defiantly. It takes two big, like a forehand and then a backhand with the same attack arm. On the forehand, it tries to glob you with the same stuff it tried to glob cells. On the backhand, however, its entire hand suddenly ignites and it just back slaps you with its bladed, flaming hand. As it draws itself back up and looks at it again. As you, you're up. Kill it. Would you like to ask me how beaten up it looks? Yeah. Quite statistically, you were in a really good place. You rolled really badly last time, but I might, I might do that again. Like I if, feel like look, I have really bad luck. If, if the dice go wrong, we lose this game. That's, that's a fact. D20 systems. That's a natural one again. Mm. Okay. I put my crossbow away, draw the potion of greater invisibility and net. I would like to know how many hit points you're on. 28. 39. So all quite low. First attack is at Azu. Yep. It's got a miss. Come on, it's a really good No, miss. it didn't miss last time. Yeah, I know, but it has to. <laughs> yes. I, I no, it doesn't have to. <laughs> this is Alex no fun. Misses by one. Takes a second swing at Azu. <laughs> This is where we know Alex doesn't fudge, but we also like. No, that's a hit. That's okay. a hit. That's a hit. Its hand, as it comes to basically plow into your face, suddenly emits a great big white hiss of mist. Let's say it smacks you, and you take an additional four cold damage. What total damage was that? Twenty-three. So I've got five hit points left. Yeah. I'll try. I do. Yup. First attack. Oh, thank 33. God. Hits. I would like to try and hit it. Uh, like you said, there's fluid in it. Yep. Try and hit it in the fluid. You do so. You swing for it and you smash a fluid as well on its leg. It looks really heavily damaged. I take my second attack. Yeah. Please, I beg you. No. Doesn't hit. Right, that's two. Okay. Scream. It glances off it, I'm afraid. Unseen by all. Freeze Dragonfly. It gets no reflex save. It is not aware of me. This is a correct this statement. This is full damage. Go ahead, kill! Please kill this thing. That's a good roll. Three, two, one. Let's go. I mean, Hamid, Hamid Invisible moves up beside Azu. Unknown, unseen and unleashes a breath of pure rage in a desperate attempt to save his friends because he can see how badly beaten they are. He deals 54 damage. Oh, what are you? Oh what my god. You? A dragon okay. dragon. <laughs> so three things. First thing, 
if it had got a hit on you, as you would have just died. I know. Number two. I'm very aware. Due to additional things, there's a solid chance it probably would have KO'd Zolf in the same turn. The <laughs> fire breath begins. Showing Stop fire. Strike well, breath. The showing monster, I should say, right. has enough time to turn and go, Argh! and starts reaching out to try and swipe what's blowing. As it is reaching out, the fire breath is destroying the bits of it, Ooh. so that as it's reaching out, bits of it are breaking away, and it can't get either hit off till it eventually is just down, and the breath is still coming till eventually there is a charred husk of what are now seemingly mundane materials popping and burning. It is brutal. Can I just say that I view this as an attempted murder? And then last but not least, you do find a diary. <gasps> like, it's clearly a diary. It has dates. It's done, to like, at a first glance, it's done in a very, very neat Japanese. Oh, my God. I think it might be Sherwin's diary. It is completely florid goddamn nonsense. Mm. And it is clear that this was meant to be published at some point. Skipping to the end, yeah. they aren't Japanese. They might be, like, a child's copy of like Japanese um, pictographs. Oh dear. It, it, it uh, isn't really pictographs. Uh, there's, a, there's a decent number of sketches in there. Yeah. The latest sketches are extremely abstract. Some of the drawings cross over pages and there are no dates of any kind. You, you suddenly realise, Sal, that you can literally hold it up and go flipbook style yeah. and watch it just start fine, 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 fine and then about two thirds of the way through, it just real quick turns into, honestly, like, like geometric the, patterns. The obvious question to very ask. Very abstract. It, like, Sel so will summarise the. So it degrades clearly. I'm just gonna hunt through and try and work out what exactly was happening at the point where he began to degrade, because yeah. something is happening to his thinking. I mean, look at that. That kind of abstract geometry is not doing any favours. You skip and notice that the first sort of major transition happens at the halfway point. The halfway point of the diary goes from stuff like, I was telling the Prime Ministerial candidate of the 17th Prefecture the other day about blah blah blah, to basically going like Eureka and becomes all shop, no fluff. He has been interested in, he genuinely uses the phrase expanding his consciousness, uh, beyond the limitations of his material form. He's utterly convinced that he can do it, and at the halfway point, he, he has. He realises that he has built that chair in the in the table and he successfully, for a short period of time, hooked him up into his entire infrastructure. He goes off for a while talking about what it's like to see from a thousand eyes, hear from a thousand ears, oh, no. uh, and breathe through the very fires of the earth. As it goes on, though, it becomes apparent that he... Phase one was rigging himself up to his infrastructure, okay? Phase two was being able to sustain that. He placed himself in this this basically sealed bubble because, frankly, he needed to make sure that his meaty vessel didn't crap out on him. Phase three was, it'd be better to be able to just check into my meat body occasionally, but spend most of my time here. So he, he managed that, apparently. It sort of starts to go wrong from here really where the handwriting starts to degrade he hasn't gone completely cuckoo bananas but nonetheless like the handwriting is starting to get a bit awkward and he's mentioning that he's trying to jump back into the body but it just it's, it's, it doesn't really move at the kind of speed that he needs it to and it, it keeps it's getting thinner he does start to go off on one at one point where he discovers a cave system and basically mentions that all of his labour problems are solved and then, last but not least, he is starting to get a bit bored. People start turning up. People keep trying to investigate. So he has a bit of fun. Why not? He was having a whale of a time because he's just like, listen, being transcendent is great, but it's nice to take a load off. 
climb inside your big brain orb and just design some new traps for, for people to make for you. It's, it's a good way to, you know, kick back. Then things go really weird where, for the first time in ages, one of the clerics made it all the way to the uh, puzzle table. Plugs them in and uh, has a nice little direct conversation, because obviously you do. So you said there was something weird in the cleric, right? Like the 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 veins. The cleric's the, got the veins. They have, right. Yeah, so veins. that's the point. That yeah. At which point the kind of degrade. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Gets very very steep. He he's he's afraid. Basically, he's he's afraid of what's happening. He says two things, which are the key takeaways, which is me closing out this diary. Number one, he says that he's managed to halt it. The cost is high, but worth it. And the second thing is. He believes that he has the means to transmit his solution across to the remainder of his network. However, he prays that he retains enough of himself that he might be able to enact this. I walk into your room, I put the two glasses down on whatever surface there is, I pour two large glasses, oh. one slightly larger than the other, I hand you the larger one, because mm. you are larger than me. Hey, Hamid. The letter is on the bedside table. Cool. I will not acknowledge that. You're a big idiot. <laughs> okay, not how I expected this to start off, but fine. I hold out my glass and just go, to Sasha. <sighs> yeah, to Sasha. And clank it. So, what? Yeah. So, you have to remember that you're my friend and you're my role model for all of this, and you don't need to worry so much. You're doing fine. And just because I say when stuff's getting on my nerves and things, it doesn't mean that you, you're bad and wrong. It's just. Stuff to work on, like I've got stuff to work on. Okay. Um, it's, um, yeah. This isn't about me getting you upset. Uh, so, you ain't got to worry about that, and, um... <sighs> so, I was so... I was so angry at you. What for? For leaving! <laughs> Leaving and then, then my sister died in Prague, and Sasha was nearly dead. And I was so angry, but I do get it. I do get it, Zolf. And you've changed, and I can see how much you've changed. And you're doing so good, and you, Zolf. I don't know what I'm saying. I just, I hate that we can't get on alright then we'll work on it why don't you just look just I don't want you to leave again I'm not going to leave again go get some sleep right just I know tell me it's going to be okay Zoff I hope it's going to be okay I'll drink to that And unconsciousness claimed. <laughs> Fair. And I will heft him back to his room and put him to bed. just plows into the tree cover. It tears a chunk of the ship off on the one side. It smashes into the port engine viciously, which sets the whole thing on a twisted landing, so it's not even coming in straight now, it's coming in on a slide. It plows into the clearing, almost broadside. see straight out of the gate Barnes is in a tree and impaled certainly not conscious <gasps> Carter is not moving is also seemingly unconscious and landed literally on a boulder 
you also see a couple of smaller snow piles which are definitely cobbled. It's clearly crashed hard. Like, yep. hard. Right, but Cell doesn't know that anyone's been thrown off. Um, no. So Cell, relatively cheerily, uh, dashes up to the top deck. It's like, right, we made it! No explosions, no explosions, not even one! Everyone, everyone are... And, uh, like, looking around. Uh, uh, what? No, uh, no, 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 not again. Not, not again. Barnes up the tree, still sort of impaled but through near the hip, awakens, looks down. Oh no, there is no movement from Carter. Right, everybody, find Azu and find anyone who's unconscious. Bring them to me or Azu, we can sort them out, right? I'm going out and I'm going to start helping people. Bring them to me, let's go! And then I'm going to leap over the side of the ship um, and start running to the first person that I can see on the floor. That will be Wild. Just going to Wild. <sighs> wild has been completely impaled on a fragment of ship. <gasps> oh, God. You, you can tell at a glance you don't need a heel check. He, he's dead. This isn't a case of like, oh, maybe like he's, he's gone. <sighs> Move on. Hamid starts digging into the piles of snows uh, into the piles of snows like frantically he's, he's crying he's he probably his hand his hand will claw up yeah, and yeah. He, he's, he's trying to suppress it and failing as he just kind of scrabbles he want, he, to try and pull the, the two cobbles out of their little snow mounds. you first find Sassara oh. Sassara is dead there is a a, a, a scream, like a proper grief scream from Hamid, but he, he flings himself into the other, the other pile of snow. Uh, the second kobold of Merc is also dead. Hamid collapses onto his knees and screams into the sky, and a line of fire just shoots his whole body directly upwards. Azu's going to try and pray to Aphrodite. Can you just explain to me the nature of the prayer and that will explain the nature of the response? Azu is going to go and find an, a little quiet place, like probably at the edge of the clearing, and she's going to get her necklace out and hold it. She's going to reach out and the question that she's asking is... Am I a stupid and bad healer? You have the distinct feeling, and this has never happened to you before doing this, that there is a benign presence stood behind you. Azu turns around. There's no one there. Ah. Oh. Azu closes her eyes again. The benign presence clearly returns. <laughs> <laughs> you feel like... a hand <laughs> gently reach and grab your hand and just give it a gentle squeeze. Oh. Okay. Azu is vaguely reassured. There is a voice in Azu's ear. This has never happened before. Ooh. Healing and patience are often as well. That's very wise. So, yeah, there, there is that voice and a squeeze on the hand. Oh. And the hand is still there. Like, it doesn't squeeze and then disappear. It is still holding tight. Azu squeezes back. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, pendant starts to grow very very warm and you can see the light it is emitting through your eyelids to be clear this is all way more like way more than you've ever really been used to as a thing this is not here's a nice little you know feeling inside here is a full-blown manifestation of which in terms of like what you were taught at school it's a big deal (laughs) it's a pretty big deal there's one part of azu that's going 
well, Zolf said that weird things are fine now, so maybe we should be fine with this. <laughs> and then there's another part of her that's freaking out, like, oh my god, it's Aphrodite! <laughs> <laughs> As Azu continues to have this internal debate, <laughs> the hand finally lets go. Okay. And the benign presence just feels like it has left. Okay. Oh. Azu feels better. I've just got to sort this. If I could just sort this, then then we can get on then with things. Then we can things. go? I just need to f- I, yeah, I just need to sort this. What, what I'm... What I'm okay. thinking is... Do, do you need help? If, do, do, what I'm what I'm saying, Sephora, is you 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 can. Do, do you want? We lost you, but there's there's a way back, and you you. Do, do you want to come? No, no, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. We just need to finish this, and then we can we can do whatever. It's fine. I just need to finish it. Okay. Well, well let me help. I'll... Okay. Cool. Right. Okay. So, where does this go? At which point you're looking at an enormous, like the size of Sasra conical flask, just unnecessarily massive, and the setup so far could probably fit on a small table. I'm. This may be a rolling point because yep. Sela's trying to work out if this is an unsolvable puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. This you reckon a... this is an unsolvable puzzle? Okay, Sasra, this this place is cool. It's wonderful, and I'm so happy that it's it's here for you. But there are other really cool problems, and your friends, and 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 I hope I'm your friend, and we can do more stuff back back on the on the ship. So it's 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 a choice, Sasha. But there's there's I can't I can't. We won't be able to finish this, right? It's not a fix it and then you move on to the other thing you don't get to complete everything you're gonna have to choose Sasra kind of takes a moment puts the two components down and just gives a bit of a (sighs) this will still be here won't it it'll still be here I I'm I'm pretty sure this or, or something like it even better Sasra gives you a sidelong glance. Yep. I'll make you deal. Okay. We don't solve this now. Right. But you and me solve this later, you know, when we get time. You know, when we've, we've, dealt, we've, we've dealt with everything else. It's all done. It's all solved. We can come back here and finish this together. Sasra, I, I would like nothing else better in the entire world. You promise? I I promise. Hey, um Scrog, I think I I, th- I think it's like properly over. <laughs> I'm sorry, um but I had a I don't know what yours was like. I had a chat and it was a choice for them to come back, and I don't know what... Did you... You, you went under, right? You do it again. It. We can do it again. Just no. Do it again. Scrog, did you, did you give them a choice? Well, yeah, obviously. And what did they choose? Wrong. Just do no. it again. Scrog, you got to... They made a choice. you got to let them go. That's... We can't... They made the wrong choice, so we could do it again. We're just going to no. sit here, and we're going to do it again, and then they'll make the right choice, and it'll be fine. They made the choice... That was right for them. You've got a. Scrark suddenly leaps up, stomps over past one of the pots that was holding some um, some of the pungent incenses and stuff like that. Bashes past it. It doesn't shatter, but it does fall, and then just stomps out the front of the building. Just bang! Just stomps off. I'm going to follow Cell. Yep, sure. You easily find Scrark around the back of the building, mm. kicking it. Not hard, just kind of... Yep. <laughs> hey, hey, uh... Hey, buddy. Um, hey. Hey, I don't know if you want to be alone, but I just want you to know you don't need to be. It's fine, it's fine. It's fine. I don't think... I mean, you, you'll be thinking a lot of things... But I, I know if if 
where you were chatting to Merrick was anything like where I was chatting to Sasra. Like it was, it was nice, right? And and it was, it was a good place. And so it's, it's not. Scrock gives a, a sad smile. It's not that they're in a bad place, but I I also know that that doesn't mean you're not frustrated and you're not missing. <sighs> I'm, I'm not annoyed at Merck. I'm annoyed at me. No, I I you know I I kind of I kind of want to say I get it, but I also know that it's always unique, and I'm not gonna say stupid things like it's not your fault or it's not like it's not about that or all the all the things that you could say because I know it never feels like that. It's that um. It's that, it's that, you know, you're you're not alone with it, and I'm sure you... The, the, you know, the, the decisions are made, right? Like, I think with whatever you said, it's not... It's not about the specifics. I hope you don't become obsessed with the little things that might have been different, because actually, these no, decisions... No, it's not, it's not that either. Um, yeah? I'm annoyed because I wanted Merc, but... Yeah. Yeah. Even when Merc didn't want to come back, I still wanted Merc to come back. I think I think so. We'll just like sit and be like, it's yeah. 